it here. All right, so uh, today what we're going to look at is um, a couple things really face on. Uh, it's, it's not directly face on, and I chose this video just because um, uh, it's a little offset, and I like that because you'll see more of the body action. Let me, let me uh, make this smaller so we can see it here. Uh, but I like that because we can, you, you'll see more of the things we talk about, like with float, you know, uh, contain and delivery and so forth and the alignments. I think this is a really good view to see some of the, some of the things definitely in the float zone. So um, this Jordan speed, you know, there's, I use really any, any player I think that has really good credibility as far as ball striking, uh, you know, week in, week out. Um, I want to, I want to use that. Uh, Dustin Johnson, I use um, all the time. And if you've been on my webinars for any length of time, you'll, you've, you've heard for the last few years that um, I, when I was witness, the, the only player that, that I really witnessed that I felt like um, was just above and beyond everybody else. Uh, when you, when you go to the uh, tour on the PJ tour, it was um, with my eyes was uh, Dustin Johnson. And I don't say that now because he's, you know, his rankings and what he's done and those things like that. And cause he's a great athlete and things like that. I'm just saying this cause that's who he is. So he just, he, he, when I watched him on the range, when I watched him play and those things right, you know, right up front, I could see things with him that were different than every, everybody else. That was back when Tiger was still around. That's back when Rory and all those players and Jordan and so forth. So it's ball, ball striking. There's, there's really two players, uh, you know, with, with Jordan speed, um, He's kind of like the new Henrik Stenson. I mean, his iron play is is the best in the world. Uh, he's, he's he's still a really good ball striker, top to, you know top to bottom. Uh, but with overall, I would say uh, the best, the, the, no doubt, question about the best I've ever seen is Dustin Johnson. But um, you know, there's things that he can do that most of us can't. But there's still things that he's doing that most people need to be trying to do in the gym uh, to increase, if, if get fit five to 10, 15, 20 percent better of those things in the gym. Um, that'll increase, uh, you know, that'll convert over onto the golf course. So, but with, with Jordan, um, uh, you know, it, they're different, you know, they, there's, there's things that, uh, um, they're, they're, they're just different. Uh, if, if, uh, if iron play wise, like I said, if you look at like between uh, Jordan and Henrik Stenson, if you look at the similarities, there's, a, they have a lot of similarities is how they come through the ball, getting a really clean strike that way they have really good distance control and dispersion from the hole and so forth. So with that being said, uh, we'll start this up. So this is slow mo, this is a driver, but it's like I said, it's offset angle. I, I, I'm doing this for a reason. I could definitely put it face on, but we'll take a peek at it. And if you look, uh, whoops, and it just backed up on me. We'll take this second here. All right, so when we look at this swing uh, with Jordan, um, You'll start seeing as it goes into slow motion right about there, you'll start to see that there's that sinking that we talk about. There's the there's slowing down effect uh, and the circling all happening, at, you know, all happening at one time. And as he comes out, that's where, you know, um, you know, we talk about where that the left arm left arm internally rotates and the right wrist bends right in this area. It's already happened. It's already done by now. But I'm just saying that you've seen those things coming in and now coming out. It's just, you know, he's delivering the club. And so, you know, you're going to see some spacing with this left arm. Uh, some people like that. Some people don't. I like it probably shade tighter where you can't really see daylight in this left arm. But he's still got a tremendous amount of angle with the shaft. Um, and his body hasn't over rotated or under rotated you know it's it's just it's just right on it's 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 exact relative to what he's trying to do i shouldn't say trying what he's doing through impact it's, it makes sense and every every player's body rotation will always look different relative to what they have to have because it's not one of those things you're never going to be able so that's the one thing like if you take you know i've, I've done with i've dealt with biomechanics for a long, long, long time and devices that can tell your exact measurements of tilt, bend, rotation, all these types of things. What happens in reality and the reason why there's no way to say there's it, it, it's an exact amount is because a lot of factors, you know, with what they're doing with their wrists and arms is going to make a lot of difference with what they're doing. Any grip, it's going to make a lot of difference with what they're doing with their body through the ball. And so you can't say it's going to be 
uh, you know, 25 degrees open with the hips at impact or 70, 70 degrees open, you know, um, with the hips. And you have to realize anytime you start to say a number, probably there's, and I'm, when I say this, you, there's some give and take here on this because it's not exact. I don't have a science to it. I'm just putting a number together. But if you say like traditionally, it's like if you were like 40 degrees open, that was pretty common uh, with what you would take an average of the tour players, uh, LPGA, PGA, uh, with hips through the ball and probably around 20 with the shoulders. If that's pretty right average, but they're all a little bit different. And if you take anything more than that, um, that doesn't mean they're using their hips anymore, the rotation, that means they're giving up their lumbar, so what I'm, their spine, so their lower body, or, you know, lower back, excuse me, so if I'm, if I'm down here, if you can just picture right where the belt buckle is there, right below that, that's your lumbar spine, and so when you give that up, what that means, when I say give that up, that means that you are um, excessively rotating in that area, and that you probably get an injury. And that's what happened, you know, Tigers had it, Roy's had it, you know, every, and, you try, and, you know, and it, the back's a mystery. Uh, I will say this, nobody can say because the amount of rotation you have in a golf swing is how you're going to be as far as, you know, durability and the longevity of your career and things like that. But if you look at people that always had excessive hip rotation, you, 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 what, what, in what you, what we classify that when you see it like just a visual, say, oh, their hips are way rotated. What we don't think about is in biomechanics terms, they don't like when you look, when you talk to a biomechanist, they, they don't look at it like that. They look like, no, your, that's your hip rotation really is around, should be around 30, 35 degrees through the ball. And so you have lumbar, you know, you have support through the core to protect your lumbar. Whereas if you see somebody at 60, 70 degrees of rotation, which that's excessive, but I mean, but if you have somebody on tour that has a tremendous amount of opening out of transition and through the ball, you're going to see with all that separation, you're going to see uh, players eventually get injured. So if you take, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Jim Furyk had back surgery, you know, he was out for a couple of years way back. Most people don't even know when that was. He does. Um, you take, you look at uh, Tiger, you look at uh, Roy McIlroy, a lot of people have this tremendous amount of separation uh, between their lower and upper body, which most people think is awesome, you don't, but you don't realize that separation is um, causing shear force on the spine. And so typically what you'll have with that is you'll have a player that ends up pulling the soft tissue of the left side over here on this, you know, basically in through your lat and your rib cage, and then they'll end up, uh, you know, for the most part, kind of crushing this this right side, the bony the bony side on this right side. So they start to you know the spine starts to shift a little in these areas, and the muscle starts to pull. And that's why you see a lot of players on tour that um, that have um, those issues where they pull the muscle. And man, you pull you pull. I've done this, so I can speak as somebody that has had this happen. Uh, you pull those muscles on that rib off the, on that rib cage, and I assure you, that's worse than any back pain that's ever that any player's ever experienced. And you can't play. It's not like if you have a back injury, you might be able to get through a round. Like you might be able to, um, you know, really get through uh, a tournament, and you know, kind of like okay, now I got to rehab this thing. But if you have a rib injury uh, on that lead side. There, there, you, there is not a human being that's got the one. Um, there's not enough painkillers pain in the world to be able to cure that back, possibly, but not on the not on the rib cage. You pull those muscles, and I'm telling you, you cannot breathe, and it is, it is crazy. And we stretch these as as players. Um, you know, we, I talk about through thoracic mobility all the time, but it's also through that rib cage area and that lat. But when players get in this area, you know, he's not near as good. Now, this is Jordan, so he's not near as good as, as what I would consider like a Dustin Johnson. But he, you can see the stretch that we put in the torsion um, that we put through this area and how these muscles are getting, you know, stretched this way and, and torqued up. And, you, and that's, you, that's a necessity. The more you have of that, the, the more you can, uh, you know, increase, uh, you know, you, the more you can increase uh, torsion at the top of the swing or in transition. Uh, you don't mean you have, you don't have to, I mean, you can stretch a little bit, you don't, but what I'm saying is for, if you just want power, 
you know, you, you're going to, you, you, these players, trust me, if they just want just raw power, the more you can stretch it through this area. And of course, the, I always talk about through that thoracic area, those, those muscles are crucial for that. Uh, it doesn't mean you, you have to have those to play great golf, but uh, boy, there's definitely a connection with it though, with thoracic and that, that lead side. So those muscles are extremely tight. Usually you can see people kind of, you know, they kind of bend to the, to the left and you don't, they don't really turn, they lift their arms and things like that. So, I mean, without getting too complex with that, yet that's some of the issues you would see with those, you know, severe limitations, uh, you know, and, uh, but with that going, uh, with, with going forward with that, um, what I wanted to say, you know, uh, is today is really about just, just getting into understanding how to turn and, and, and then all over the tops of your feet. All right. And then how to, you know, as you're coming through the ball, how you line the club up. I mean, that was that's really my goal today. Um, you know, with me doing this as long as I've done it, the, the thing is it can get off topic and on topic a lot because I've done this for so long. But um, I, I did want to explain some of those things um, earlier. So I hope, hope everybody kind of understands that. Now, as we're moving forward from here, this is a great angle, like I was talking about earlier, um, to see where you're seeing the sinking uh, the speed's good. You see the sink and the circle. And then now here we go. And so you see space. Um, here's that space I was talking about earlier. Right in here. A lot of times you won't see that. A lot of people get caught up with uh, with, with Jordan about um, his, um, if you look, it's not like a, uh, Lee Westwood, but if you look, as far as coming through in this area, you kind of see some of that, some of you, you know, well, to back a little bit. It's kind of like his, his left arm kind of, it doesn't really chicken wing, but it just kind of, his left arm bows off of his body, if that makes sense. Um, not like his left wrist, but more like his left arm. And so if you see it with wedge play, it looks a lot of times much different because, but with this, what he's doing, you know, what's really great about what you're seeing here when I see, if you look at the videos I talk about, the shaft is on the inside of the arm here the entire time. OK, that's really good. So, again, we're going to take a look one more time. We're going to back this up. And then I just want you to get a visual of the speed and where I talk about where the float really starts. If you look here, right in this area, you're going to start seeing some of the sinking and then the wrist bending, like I talked about with the internal left arm and the right wrist bend. You just saw it there. That's happening. And so forth. And again, all this is happening in flow. So I mean, you know, it's, you know slow motion's good in some ways, and slow motion's bad in some ways. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit here before we take another look at that. You, if you only look at your swing in slow motion, um, you're, one, you're gonna, you're not going to probably see your transition speed very well. Um, also, you're not seeing reality very well. You're only seeing it, you know, like broken down in really slow frames, and that's not always really the best case. So there's times where you want to look at your swing in slow motion. You mo probably more like around angles. I would say if you're looking down the line, face on, I like to see it real speed. Well, I like to see both. Uh, you know, I like to see I like to see both. Uh, you know, but you in face on reality, the speed in reality uh, means a lot because you can start to see like. If the player's losing width, you know, out of transition, you can see if they're speeding up, if they're jumping in transition, whether it be body or club. Um, I think it was, uh, I don't, like I said, I don't read Golf Digest anymore. I, you know, I read it my whole life when I was a kid and, and a lot of years as I was a professional in, in training and so forth. Just, you know, it was good knowledge and learning, but, you know, I've kind of passed a lot of that stuff. But I will say, I think there was an article in this month or last month, it was about Gary Woodland talking about how Butch Harmon, you know, helped him as he came out of transition. It's what we talk about a lot, and I, I stole this from Butch as well, uh, is keep maintaining this radius, all right? Main, you, don't want, you don't want this club to break down toward, you don't want it to break down towards your body, Um. That is something you do not want. You want to be able to maintain this width. You're not, I'm not saying cast the club out. I'm just saying you want to be able to maintain this, this, uh, the width. Um, 
the angle and the width are different. So the angle being that, you know, from if you just take this angle here from your left arm to your wrist to your club, there's your angle. But we're talking about maintaining that with a tremendous amount of um, width away from your body on the downswing. Um, there, that creates space. It, it keeps you from getting jammed. And so what Gary Wiggle was talking about was he would run the club into his body like this. And then his body would be jumping to try to get out of the way. And then he'd have a left and right miss. You know, it wasn't something he could really, um, it was very hard for him to stay consistent all the time with it, even though, you know, he's a phenomenal, he's a very, he's a phenomenal iron, iron player. He's a phenomenal ball striker. But, you know, it, it, the narrower he gets and the more he jumps with his body, the worse it gets for him at his level. So, and I believe that's at every level. So that's something to, 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 to understand if you've ever heard me talk about it. this club can also, by the way, move away a little bit. You know, David Toms, J uh, Justin Thomas does this. The club can move away a little bit. You, you don't want to fully cast this thing out, but it can move away from your wrist from here to here. It can definitely do that a little bit. And I've talked about that in some of my videos. I like it because the more if it moves away, uh, if it moves away too much, it's a cast and that's a no go. But if it moves away a little bit, that creates more distal and speed. So it's almost like a hammer throw uh, in a way. And that's why I talk about that in my videos. If you've never heard me explain it, well, here you go. So, um, again, as we're talking about coming through the ball now, um, from here, it, let me back up just a hair. Because at, if, once he comes in to transition the float in this area, this is where he's making um, – he's – I wouldn't he's definitely not thinking about it this is where things are happening with him subconsciously they're just going on so he's starting to sink you can see it he's starting to uh, internally rotate the left arm and then you see the right wrist bend and he's circling at the same time that we talk about and then naturally his body for the most part really just kind of clears itself it makes itself it's not like he's trying to I, I you just don't see anybody. You don't ever hear anybody on the tour says, I'm trying to get through. You know, well, they say get through the ball. I, I shouldn't say that. They don't. You, but when I say that, they're not doing it with their body because it because his body is opening um, however much, you know, whether it's a little bit or a lot or whatever is not really what they're trying to do in their when they're over the ball. You know, all they're doing, um, uh, they're reacting to what their wrist and their arms are doing. And. If you get those two right, these players know how to turn, you know, as far as in the backswing. I mean, they all turn a little different. They turn coming through the ball a little different. But they understand what they have to do um, to get through the ball to, to make the ball go where they want. And so what I mean by that is it's it's for, it's for it's always different. That's why you can never say it's like going to be 25 degrees with this player, 45 or whatever. It's really not something you're ever going to want to do. What happens is if you get your wrist and arms and your eyes right, your hand-eye timing, you get all that right, um, your body will respond to what you need. Um, and when we get in, caught into saying, oh, well, they're physically limited with their internal hip rotation or they can't do this or this or this, um, that plays some, but not that plays some factor. But you know, not not all. I mean, there's players at every level with that on the tour um, that have different levels of being able to, you know, you know, physically, you know, if you do like a, a basic TPI test, for example, they're all over the charts, man. I've seen players that they've told um, that couldn't, you shouldn't be able to break an egg. They should be a bad ball striker and all this stuff. And, you know, they're on the PGA tour and have won on the PGA tour and the champions tour. You can't look at somebody and do a test in a gym format and say you can or can't, um, you know, be something. I've seen players that pass every single test flying colors at the highest level that can't break a hundred uh, in golf. So the skill set is way beyond what the actual, uh, limitations may be. Uh, I'm not and I'm not saying that you wouldn't want to correct function because function, you know, it has a lot to do with injuries and things like that. But where I think we lose the art form of this is sometimes is where people think that, um, you know, it's only in the gym or this or this or this. Well, really, it's only on the course. So you build your skill set on the golf course, not the driving range on the golf course. And you chip away at your skill set a little bit through, you know, the driving range. You chip away with it. Um, on your um, in the gym, uh, a functional training, you're chipping away at it again. Mental training, you're chipping away. Competition, you're chipping away at it a lot. I mean, you're, there's a lot of things that you're chipping away at what you're trying to achieve. And it just doesn't start at like 
all right, you go in the driving range and you do this all day long, or you go to the gym and you, you correct your thoracic mobility, which I talk about all the time, you're going to be awesome. No, nope, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if, if you get your hand-eye coordination right, and really technically it'd be hand-wrist-arm coordination correct, uh, you, your odds go up to play better golf. And then if you increase your body, you put the motor behind it, your motor gets better and your, uh, your, your frame and your durability gets better. Um, yeah, I believe that that's a secret to success, but uh, because you can do a 40 inch box jump and you've got full thoracic mobility and you can do a 400 pound squat and you deadlift 400 pounds and whatever, that means nothing to me. I don't know that means you're going to be a good player or not. I have to see you hit the ball. And there's people will work around those limitations if you play long enough. And that's why playing is most important and competing because that players aren't really taught to figure out their style. They, they, they just find their style. And there's no coach in the world can teach somebody to find their style. They can teach them how to embrace their style. You know, like, so if you, for instance, what I mean by that, if Jim Furyk comes to me tomorrow, you're talking about the guy that shot the lowest score on the PGA Tour history. Uh, in, in PJ Tour history, he had college coaches telling him he would never be able to play college golf unless he changed his golf swing. He had uh, professionals telling him that. His dad was his own coach. What I'm saying, is his dad embraced what he could do, what he knew, what he knew his son could do. He, he played this way, uh, and the only way you could make it better was just embracing it. He already knew he could play. I mean, there's no question about that. Now, we can't change what we are. We have to embrace what we are who we are and we have to figure out how this style functions the best because it's your style and so if a coach comes in like Hank Kane he's notorious for this and I said the name I don't care um, he's notorious for going in and trying to implement styles his style on the professional style and when you do that misery starts I can assure you I've seen it hurt there's you, you, all you have to do is be in my industry and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about David Ledbetter, Ledbetter is notorious for that the reason why Butch Harmon is known for being such a, a great coach is there's a lot of reasons but if you just take all that everything out of the equation um, the reason why he is is because he embraces the player's style and he respects them when they walk onto the field the golf course he respects who they are far more than he does himself or his philosophies and all this he looks at like okay you're if you're this amazing you know we're not going to you know rewrite the book here what we're, we're going to do is figure out how i can throw little pieces at you and somebody would i mean truthfully at the end of the day a lot of it's band-aids because you're not changing their style um and i think that's i believe in my heart 100 percent. that's the most important thing that anybody that's on this webinar or that hears me talk or anything like that. I, yeah, I teach a style. I've got things I like. I like things, but I've always, if you listen to my videos, there's, you can adjust. There's there, when you're in transition, um, the transition of the golf swing is the most important. It's not impact. It's transition. How you recover with whatever style you want to create going back. There's a recovery. There's an adjustment. Every player proves it. Ryan Moore, uh, you know, Justin Thomas, uh, you got Jordan Spieth, uh, Henrik Stinson, Tiger, uh, Jim Furyk, as I was talking about, Kenny Perry. They all have these adjustments. That they out of when they come into that first stage of transition, and as they go through the second, and third, once they come out of the third stage of transition, that's it. They're they're ripping it, good or bad. I mean, it could be a pro or it could be a hack i don't really care I'm, what i'm saying is when they when you come out of transition and if you're trying to fix impact or you're trying to fix this and that um that's probably already been created um in those first coming into transition second third and third stage so that's why I, I believe that you know transition i spend so much time talking about that you know if you look at like a player like jb holmes he is he, he doesn't turn on his backswing like a Dustin Johnson but you know if you look at them overall you know they're not that far apart as far as ball striking you know they both crush it I mean I don't think he's from what I've seen and witnessed it, it, as good as is um, uh, Dustin Johnson but I will say this that I think he's really freaking good and if you look at his record he can hit it he can play and he can win on the PGA Tour and so my point is, it's there's a lot of different ways to get the job done, but you have to, the most important thing is finding your style. I think you find your style not through books and all these things. I think you find your style by going out and playing and competing, which is 
all I talk about on webinars and anybody that's been on here with me for a while, um, you, you put yourself in, in, in tough situations and, um, and you put some money behind it, you know, like I, I, I put it this way. It's like, um, I had a player one time that, that said, you know, I can't draw the ball. And I said, well, you know, yeah, I, I would, I would, I get it. I mean, I know why, I mean, was, I see it technically and all this stuff and he's a good, really good player. Can't really draw the ball. And I said, but you know, if we go out on the golf course right now and I have you compete and I put money against it, you can't draw the golf ball and we do it every day, not on the range. If I just go through a range and say, Oh, we're going to hit these positions. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it's going to make you draw the ball. And that's what most instructors do. Me included, you know, that's kind of like where you have to go with it. Um, but if I take, I could fix that same player. Well, I did. And I said, look, we're going on the golf course. I bet you five bucks. You can't, you know, you can't draw it. And, you know, it get, then he gets, you know, the person gets pissed off and they start competing because I'm saying you can't do it. And they want to prove now they were the ones that said they couldn't do it originally. Now they're pissed off. I'm saying that they can't do it and I'm put money on it. And next thing you know, they start figuring it out. Yeah, they lose a little bit. And then all of a sudden they're like, I don't they just figure the visual and the creativity and artistic part comes out and then the technique comes behind it. It finds it. So there's so many different ways to improve um, and achieve the things you're looking for. Technically, a lot of times what I find is people, when they start doing technically, they're hitting numbers and positions and these things. And yeah, there's certain things that have to happen to make that ball do that. Correct. I don't disagree. But when you're trying to do that, um, it just seems like then you get two weight misses, you get analytical, you lose your rhythm and your flow and your chi. Um, and if you just use it as far as a competition going out with a friend or um, somebody you're trying to that can draw the ball and you say, all right, you know, let's play, let's play five dollars a shot. You know, my ball's got to bend as much as yours and end up in the same spot. If I had a pull draw, I lose double, you know, so you, you play these little games in your competition. You'll you'll get eventually, I believe that trumps um it gets the technique but it trumps the way we go about that so um anyway if that makes sense I, that's something that uh, i think is really important i try to say it on every webinar about how important you know the process is the process is far more important than the technique because the process will a lot of times correct the technique and so forth but anyway um I looked at what I was looking for today, you know, as far as I, mean, I talked about what I was wanting to talk about today. I'll talk about the float and the importance of it. See if you can see the timing of it. This is a great angle to look at it. Uh, you'll see everything we talk about, uh, the sink, the internal rotation, left form, and then you've got the uh, right wrist bend at the same time, and then a circle happening. And then here's your alignments. Really good. And then with that being said, I will uh, wrap it up on my end. And uh, anybody that has questions, just just let me know. Hey, Matt. Yo. Could you talk a little bit more about right wrist bend on the downswing? Yeah, I have to pull. Yeah, I can do that. Um, so hold on one second. So if you look here, um, this is a good angle, actually, look at right wrist bend. So if you look, there's not really any it looks like he's cocking his wrist here he's he's really not so let me back that out he's really just turning with his upper body and he's got some right wrist bend in this area he's not cocking the club vertically and this is a little different angle to see but he's not cocking it vertically but he's bending that wrist um the wrist bends on the same plane as the forearm so if you saw the video where it has the where i have that hinge plate um yes. on my wrist it bends relative to that that right wrist bends on that axis it doesn't cock up and down it bends on that axis of the forearm so as you're turning if you picture your right side turning fully turning that right wrist bends not it doesn't you know your wrist can't roll anyway it can't open or close only thing it does that's the forearms so you know that's biomechanically proven so your wrist can't do that so the only way your wrist can cock and side bend they can cock up and down and side bend that's the only function they have so when you get here, he's not really doing much of either. But then if you look in here, now he's starting to really bend that right wrist. All right. But here, as he comes out of this right there, there's now he's done another move. He's internally rotated the left form a little bit. And now he's bent the right wrist a little more, but he didn't collapse. So it's not cocking. It's not like he club got narrower. 
it just got he kept his width but he's internally rotated this forearm and then bent that right wrist just a shade more um everybody does that you know a little bit different you know some people do it late some people do it really early some people do it in the middle um and everything in between so that that's um his timing is probably more what i would teach you know um if you look at like where he does it if i said you know it's going back to style that's where i'd like to see it but you know like some people do it like byron nelson did it extremely late you know um there's some people that do it really early and uh, some people would do it you might, uh, when i say late that's transition there's some people that don't even do it until they're you know out of transition and you know you know down close to the baseline you know um they're kind of just slinging the club up and down and the next thing you know they recover with that movement i would say mickelson would have some of that if i was trying to explain a player so but the right wrist just bends on the axis of the same plane as the arm and there should not be any forearm, you know, ideally it wouldn't be any forearm rotation. But again, we're going back to style, but it makes it easier. So if I'm teaching a beginning golfer or a guy that shoots or a girl that shoots 85, as soon as I take forearm rotation out and show them how to bend their right wrist, I mean, they turn into, you know, high 70s right off the bat, you know, maybe lower. But, I mean, that's a gimme. But if you take a tour player that they've got their timing built in, You've got to work with the timing they have built in because they've already developed, they've already bypassed all this stuff. They can't, you don't want to go in and start rerouting um, a player that already has this figured out and don't and, and doesn't know it, but they just do it at different times. You have to work with other things at that point. And that's kind of what I was saying with, with tour players. Um, it's much easier to teach uh, if you understand how to work with their style. If you try to create a style for them, you ruin them. So uh with with amateur golf there is no such thing if you're shooting 85 there is no style I mean, you know if you're shooting 90 there's no such i mean there's a style there but it's not working so you can implement a style or um just about probably a lot of different ones um i i like what we're doing because i, I understand if you measure it and you see what reality says and what what really is going on we're, we are definitely dealing with laws of biomechanics and engineering but you know you're not you're not overall because you're playing an artistic sport, but if you look at what you can, what your wrist can and can't do, uh, and your arms can and can't do, um, when you understand that, you've got a tremendous advantage over on yourself, not anybody else, just yourself. I mean, you've got an advantage on what you already know, which is usually not much, and you've got an advantage on um, any system you want to talk about. You, you still, the arms can only do a few functions. And the wrist can only do a few functions, so there, it's not a, it's not like oh the club's open or closed. There's no, there, the only way the club can ever be opened or closed is through your arms. It's not the club. The club can't. The, you're talking, but anybody says oh the club's open or closed in this position, there's no such thing. That means your arms made a move internally rotation or external rotation. That means, and if your club is vertically cocked up and down on the downswing, um, that means that your wrists are not correctly bent. You know, there's no side bin. So there's, you, you know, I don't get into talking languages. And I know you weren't asking this, but just in general, I think it's important that everybody listening is you'll always hear uh, open, it's closed or club shut or this is you know, whatever. It's cupped at the top or no, there's no such thing. There's, there's no such thing as that. So, well, if you say cupped, it is because usually that means the wrist. So, but yeah, that, that can be. But in general, if you say the club's wide open or it's shut or it's, ver it's too steep or that, there's no such thing. Club can't. Only thing the club can do is what you, because you, you're holding it in your hands with whatever style of grip you have. But the only thing the club can do is what you do between your arms and your wrist. And, it, and the body is a part of that, but arms and wrists dictate all of it as far as angles and things like that. And far as if you want to measure like how much it's shut or open or square or whatever, that's there can be no other way. It's the arms and the wrist. So, um, and and. I think that's important, really, really important to understand. That's what I so try to do is, all the time. Let me, so try, is, let me hold on. One. Is DJ setting his at the beginning at the at, yes. at address? Is he yes. doing his wrist hinge at the beginning? Yes. And I, let's look at Brooks. Uh, I think it's kept right here. I don't, I, this guy's talking. Let me turn this off. But uh, so if you look here, here's that internal. Uh, if you look. Uh, um, 
this this left arm is turning uh, downward here, and the right wrist is bending back uh, all, at the same time. And that's that move that I talk about that I believe, um, uh, you know, I found it quite a long time ago. When you do, that pressures this side of the shaft. You can't, if his club was vertical here, let's just say that was vertical. You can see it's offset. It's not, it's not vertical. That can only happen through if his right wrist was on top of his left wrist. That's it. Um, if you look at his face where most people would say that's shut, it's, it's, it's right on the edge of it. It's not, you get you know, some pretty heated debates talking about this real quick, but it's really not shut, um, on this. Um, it, if it is, it's maybe most people would, would say, if you can see that, like you can see the face here, they would think that square is like, would be where you, the toe would be in a line with that. Like, especially with an iron, you could see it a lot better. That's, but that's not that's not what you see players do. It's not square. It's open. That would be open. So anytime the 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 shaft is one offset from the wrist, that's the right wrist bend, the bending of the right wrist, right? And so if you want don't want your club vertical, then you have to have offset bend with the right wrist. Now, and to answer your question, he does a lot of what Dustin does. Um, you know, he created his own own style. Let me see if I can find it. Um, let's see if it hopefully this plays slow motion. It may take a minute. Right, this guy's. Uh, never mind. This this is not a slow motion video, but maybe this will run it. You can see even right there, it was a beautiful example, just showing how that was bending. And and so, uh, we're getting into all kinds of crazy stuff here. But my point is with that is, yeah, Dustin does it earlier. So Jordan does it early. Uh, he does it. He does it uh, a little bit in his takeaway. If you look, if you look at, uh, let's see, right there, there, you can already see some of that right there happening. Okay. Let me see if I can pull this up. There's there's some bending right even right in there. There's some. A minimal. I mean, you're talking. I can't tell you exactly because I have no idea. But just a few degrees. Right. There's no cocking of it. But he's bending that down, and, and Justin or Dustin takes a lot of that. But a lot of what makes Ju uh, Dustin's um, where it looks like he's you know got way more is because of thoracic mobility. That's that's the reason why you see that. Um, so and that's weird. The only way I found that was through me trying to figure out one of the things that I do, I spend a lot of my time on, I always have as a kid and to, to now is I have to under, I, I don't believe you can talk about something if you can't, I can't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I can do it like Dustin Johnson, but you have to kind of get in their shoes as a coach and feel, see what they're, what they're creating, what they, what, not, not what they, they're creating, what they, what they have created. And that's been um, that's been always been my obsession. It's like, what are they? How are they? Why are they feeling that? And so mimicking um, is huge for what I do, because I have to understand where that's coming from. And what I found, because I, I one of the things that I was gifted in and I'm pretty good at um, is thoracic mobility. But I never really did it with a movement like what Dustin has. And so when I would make those movements where I press down on the club with the right hand and turn and open up my thoracic, the left wrist gets bent so much. It's crazy. Uh, and it's not a bad thing. Um, you have to work under and through the ball more through the ball. You have to you have to, your body, but you don't have to. It just kind of happens. You know, it just like you're um, you don't try to. It just becomes that because that's what you gave it. It's what you it's what you do. It's what you're dealing yourself with. Um, whereas like uh, Jordan Spieth wouldn't look as much like that because he doesn't have if he had the thoracic mobility that uh, um, Justin or uh, Dustin Johnson has, you would see a lot. It wouldn't be as much because he doesn't press down it in a, it, at first as much as him, but it would see, it would look really similar. You'd be shocked. Um at the top of the swing, what that would look like if he had the thoracic mobility, just because th there's a blend of thoracic mobility and, and what your wrists are doing. Uh, it's hard to explain. It, it, that one's that one's a tricky one. But um, and if you can't open your spine up like that, you would never feel it. You would never feel it do that. So that that's where it gets that's where it gets a little tricky. But it's not really too much important. Um, it's just either. Like my point is with that, it's just that is that they're working with what they can do.
and can't do. And I think that's the most important thing. They both have right wrist bend. They all have to have right wrist bend and internal uh, left uh, uh, forearm rotation. They all have to have that um, at some point. There's got to be a minimal amount of it. So out of transition. And that's, you know, that's the one where I was talking about the video where I was talking about, you know, kind of like what the new magic move is. The old magic move was, you know, you tuck the right arm into the rib cage and you're opening your hips. That was the Harvey Pinnock. And, but, you know, the, he, he, that's not, there's, that's, there's truth in that. But I've seen people do that that can't break 150. So it's not really a magic move to me. And I don't mean that to disrespect him at all, because if anybody knows me, I, I have an insane amount of respect for Harvey Pinnock. Um, but that that's there's more to it than that. And I think that if he was at my age and or there's going to be kids that come around that are older that, that in, in the future that will have even better explanation explanation. But you have to just come up with what you see and what you feel. And he was right in a lot of ways. But there's a lot of things that there's left undone. You know, it's not just tucking your right elbow into your rib cage on the downswing and opening up your hips. I can assure you that that's not the magic. That ain't, that ain't just the magic move. There's a lot of people that don't even touch the rib cage with their right side, with their right arm. So it's, it, and there's a lot of people that don't have to rotate that hard through the ball. Uh, it just depends on the player there, but there's things left undone about forearm rotation and right wrist bend. And that's really kind of been my calling. And that's what I believe the magic move is and that I see and feel. And, and, and when we work with players, when they get those two things to work together, um, there's no question, uh, without a doubt, it, it, um, you see results right on the spot. So, hope that hope that answers some of that. Yep, that helps a lot. Thanks. No, you got it. Um, anytime you guys want to send in videos as well, um, you know, you just just know that that. You know, I embrace that. I, the more that we do that, I think the better. Um, but even talking about some of these things, if you study these videos, there's these videos really, really cover what I'm trying to get across. And that's uh, arms, wrist and eyes. You know, you get those things on the same page, even the bunker drills and things like that. All those are just going to going to help, you know, um, better contact through the ball, you know, better strike on the ball, which is not the most important thing. It, it is you, you, you got to hit it somewhat solid. But it's also getting it started on the right, correct line, the trajectory and the ball rotation, what top what top you're looking for. Um, but those those are the things that I'm trying to improve um, when you're dealing online, because, you know. I, I can't go in and say I'm going to work with your style a whole lot. All I can do is if I improve everybody's hand eye coordination, um, it, it, whether you're on the golf course or, or my range, we're working together live or we're doing it online. If I improve your hand-eye coordination, um, however much I improve that is how much we're going to get better. If we lose it, so if we lose that, then that means how much we're going to get worse. So my point is, is that's what I was saying with you're taking somebody that if you're shooting 90, 95, 100, uh, you don't have much to lose. I mean, you're not, it's not like you're losing your paycheck from playing golf for a living. If you take somebody like Jim Furyk that, that, that actually does, that's a master, and he has his own style, and you've never – you don't know what that is and you take that style away and you say, well, we'll get better before we'll get worse before we get better. Uh, that's not a good philosophy because you, why, why do you want to get worse before you get better? I don't really understand that. He's already been through that process as a, as a kid. So he's already found that on his own and, and there's no sense that we should try to take anybody, make them worse before they get better. Uh, I don't believe in that philosophy. Uh, I think sometimes in reality it happens uh, there's a, if there's a communication error or if it's just like the player just doesn't feel it, uh, there's the possibility, but it shouldn't really happen very, very, very ra rarely should that ever happen. So um, and that's really what uh, I think is important as a player. It's the goal is not to uh, get worse, to get better. Um, I think you should be getting better right, right then. And that's what we see when we're hands on. That's what we see. We, I can't remember the last time we, we got stumped with somebody. So, um, I, I just, I can't, I know, uh, Tay and the other guys can't either. So, uh, it's, it's very, 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 I just, like I said, I can't even remember when it's been. So the, the, if you fix your hand, if, if you just get a little bit better, you get better. If you get a lot better with your hand eye and, um, hand eye coordination, 
then there you go. However much that is, is how much you improve. How much you lose of that is how much you'll lose as far as progression. So, um, any other questions? And it looks like we're good to go. Um, yeah, so we'll wrap it up uh, for the day. And um, if you have any questions, you can always send them prior to the. Uh, you can always send them during the week, and I'll put. I'll write them down and keep them in. Uh, keep them in the notes. So when we do our webinars, this is the first webinar of obviously uh, of November. We'll have another one here before Thanksgiving, and then uh, maybe hit a few in December. I usually like to do more in the in the in the winter. Uh, just because of the fact I like talking more about how to, you know, get your, your mind and body on track this time of year and work your way into spring. And then once you get into spring, you'll start hearing me coming out of that and talking a lot about play as much golf as you can possibly play and compete as much as you can. Because at that point, you really want to start switching gears and coming out of training mode into uh, playing mode. And with that being said, I appreciate everybody being on here and, and uh, hearing what I have to say. I hope everybody has a great rest of their weekend. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, guys.